Hey, what is up, everyone? Happy Monday. I uh, hope everyone had an amazing week. I was just back in Kansas City for the week. Um, did some of the draft experience stuff. Um, I'm feeling pretty good. They weren't too big on the Chiefs draft, but I feel like we had a pretty good draft. Um, got a chance to hang out with some old friends for a while, which was also nice. So hope everyone else had a good weekend. Ended April strong. My God, it is already literally May 1st, which is which is wild to think. Um, and so I know a lot of you are probably, you're like, oh my gosh, we're literally a third of the way through the year, which for me is just bonkers to think about. So really excited. Uh, we are using a different platform today. So what's up, everyone? We are using a new platform called Restream. Uh, for the first time, we are pushing over to YouTube as well, too. If you are on LinkedIn and you, you know, you're a YouTube user, you should definitely try to join there. Um, check out what I'm doing over on YouTube. I've, I've got, I don't even know how many hundreds or thousands of videos we have at this point. Um, but definitely go check out what we're doing there. If you're into sales and you like these lives, then you're going to really enjoy what we're doing on YouTube as well. So let me get this. I got LinkedIn pulled up. What's up? All my people on LinkedIn. Got a good, good crew showing up as always. Um, good to be here. Uh, here. Where are you joining from? Where are you joining from? So let me know where you're joining from. Feel free to drop in anything else you think would be fun or interesting you did this weekend. Why not? So today I'm going to talk about revenue operations, which trust me, I know a lot of you hear that word and you're like, I'm immediately going to exit out of this, this talk because revenue operations, that sounds like the most boring shit I've ever heard in my entire life. But stay with me and stay tuned, okay? I'm going to spend 20 minutes or so going deep on this. Um, as always, we will do Q&A at the end. So do me a favor. If you, um, you, know, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat. Uh, and we're just going to jump into it. So first off, uh, what's up, Cesar? Hope you're doing great, man. Um, life is good. Um, so all right, let's, let's just talk about this idea of revenue operations. So before you tune out or your eyes roll in the back of your head because you heard the word operations, um, and trust me, there's certain things where the, I have that same you know, reaction to. Uh, I want to talk about what revenue operations should be, okay? whether it's what it is at your organization or not. And, and therefore, why, as somebody who talks about modern and innovative leadership, why am I talking about revenue operations if it's, you know, kind of relevant in like the sales or revenue world? When revenue operations is done right, there's really two things uh, that I think about that they do really, really well. One is surface insights to make the organization better, faster. Okay. When I see revenue operations go wrong, is when we look at revenue operations as a report generation group or a, you know, somewhat of a recommendation group, but they should be providing insights that looking across the data, and it's really simple. Here's our sales process from marketing touch point to renewal. Where's the bottleneck? Where were the most people dropping out? And then how do we go, you know, step two is here's the insight. And step two is then what's the strategy to impact that insight as well. So for anyone out there, again, if you're thinking about revenue operations, why should I care about revenue operations? It's because when done right, they can provide insights and then action to foundationally change your sales process. Too many people, I feel like, think sales is this like, well, you know, we'll, we'll fix it every few months or every year we'll do a new methodology. And I'm like, no, if you have, a, you know, if you're pumping enough people through a system you can literally go and update that system every few weeks. Sales moves very slow. And what a good revenue operations group should do is help you to move fast and improve much, much faster than what you did before. So um, we are now into Q2. So that's just RevOps as a whole. Insights, action. Just think that. And, it, and uh, probably a lot of you are like, wasn't well, that sales leadership's job? It's like, kind of. Sales leadership should be responsible as a part of the action plan of what should we do, of course. 
um, helping to make sure that the action plan gets carried through? Absolutely. But you want your sales leaders spending more time with people, you know, whenever possible. So let's talk about what to do. Um, you know, here, you know, talk about like how to figure this out. Um, thinking about the use of technology as well. And for many of you, maybe we need to revisit the roadmap from what we put in place even just, you know, a few months ago. So the first thing I'm going to talk through, and again, I'm just basically going to give you a step-by-step -step process for fixing your RevOps org, okay? Step one is do a deep dive check-in from top down and then back to top. Okay, well, what the hell does that mean? That goes back to what I just said. You need to be able to track what happens at each step of the process. It doesn't seem crazy, but I will tell you, we work with companies that might have hundreds of salespeople, some that have, you know, if you have two salespeople, it's a little more forgivable, that, that they can't do that. They cannot tell you, hey, this is exactly where we're losing it. This is the issue. These are the pain points that people are moving through, right? And so for me, I feel like step one is really looking at your sales process, right? And, and looking at what the data says. And then let's talk about like the bottom back up, meeting with your sales organization to understand where they feel the, the challenges are. So in the macro level, I identify, here's our process, here's where, and, and another saying that I have is that there can only be one bottleneck. Think about that. We've created the word bottlenecks as a word. It's not a word. There can only be one bottleneck, right? That's it. It's same thing as like the word priorities. There can only be one priority. One, or it's not a priority. It's, a, it's like another you know, project to be done. And so if I'm a sales rev ops, top down, I'm looking at the holistic process, identifying where I think the bottleneck is and maybe some of the other culprits. Bottoms up, I'm meeting with the frontline reps to say, hey, what's working, what's not? Like what's resonating, what's not as a part of this? So I'm doing a mix of both, okay? Number two, is roadmap. And again, this is another one of those boring ones where it's, you know, what do you mean roadmap? Having a revenue operations roadmap to meticulously attack those, the bottleneck, and then the bottleneck moves and now it's this thing. And the request from the front lines is absolutely critical. I cannot tell you how many revenue operations firms or, you know, organizations we talk to that are just doing, they're getting inbound requests and they're just doing, doing, doing. And then they never really have the impact. Revenue operations never really sees the impact that they want to have on the organization because they're too busy dealing with these like one-off requests. A good revenue operations roadmap looks like your product development roadmap. Think of your RevOps is, is like your head of product for sales. And they are managing this roadmap. And the head of product doesn't get to decide all the different changes that happen. And there's little tweaks and bugs and things that need to get fixed for sure. But they're also saying, no, they're like, no, we're not going to derail this because we've got these other four things. And guess what? If you can wait 60 days, I'm going to solve seven of these things with one solution. So RevOps has to have a roadmap. Even if you're using Excel, you can use some very basic product principles too, like lift, high, medium, low, um, uh, impact, high, medium, and low to start to triage some of this. You can use tools like Jira, Asana, uh, but the best in class revenue operations run their sales organization like a product. They run it with a roadmap. They don't just, you know, I don't know, do, you know, go all over. And that goes into kind of my number three here is request management. Stop saying yes. It's okay. You can say, mm, great idea. We'll get to that in two weeks. We'll get to that in a month. You know, it's like for some reason, revenue operations tends to just do things um, as opposed to like, let me balance this against my product roadmap. Let me balance this against what the, you know, what the roadmap might look like. So for any of you out there, again, think about that, that if you're always saying yes, it becomes very, very, very difficult to like really have like a big, big impact on a lot of this stuff. So again, I really encourage a lot of you, if you are out there, you're trying to do some of these things. I want you to think about that. Think about like, you know, and this could be in your day-to-day -day life as well, too. This is not, uh, you know, uh, only specific to RevOps. The amount of, I cannot tell you how many just sales organizations in general run on like, 
well, my sale, my sales leader said we need to do this, so I'm going to do it, right? So just think about that, that it's, am I always saying yes to everything? Or do I have, again, am I properly managing this and, and saying no to certain things um, by having very clear you know, ser service agreements with different groups to where I can work on the big picture, okay? And number four, certainly last but not least, and then like always, what we're going to do is we're going to open this up to Q&A um, so we can talk about this. I've got some Q&A saved up for some other questions that people have asked over the last um, couple of weeks. So we'll spend the last 10 minutes here doing a little bit of uh, Q&A. So it should be a lot of fun. Again, if you have any questions about this, Jake, how does this apply to me? I'm doing ABC. You know, feel free to drop those in. So number four is, again, if you're trying to build this RevOps strategy that's going to just crush it for you, for not just for this year, but for the future, is you have to have a constant revision process, steps to reset and revamp, right? Again, okay, every, tw every 60 days, I go and meet with the team. We reanalyze the funnel. Again, ca candidly, you should be doing this like on a consistent basis. Like I think the best-in-class organizations truly will start to, if they are not already, just doing this in real time. We're always talking to sales about where the bottlenecks are. We are always looking at the data about where the issue is and fixing it right? And then adding that into our roadmap and saying, what should we do? How should we adjust that, right? We should continue to look at the requests. You know, again, how many, how many organizations do a review session on requests to say, hey, you know, last, last quarter, we did these 120 activities. Which of these actually moved the needle? Okay, let's go spot check these 20 okay, well, why are we even doing it? They're not even using those reports or that dashboard or that new you know, page layout. So again, most of sales where we run into trouble is that we have this mindset of fixing things in sprints and then they're fixed. The reality is if you look at product, if you look at marketing opti campaign optimization, the reality is most of these processes never truly evolve. They're never truly done is probably a better way to, to say that. Um, so for all of you out there, a couple of things. Um, one, make sure if you're not already, sign up for the Modern Leader newsletter. So let me see. I hope this works. Right? I think that that works for YouTube, but not LinkedIn. Let me go check here. This is the first time we've tried to do this kind of dual post. So still figuring out a little bit. So yeah, I, I think it doesn't post to LinkedIn. So if you're not following along on the newsletter, I mean, it's been crazy. It's growing by like a thousand people a month um, over the last few months. So we are really working to put out excellent content on what it means to be a modern, what it means to be an innovative leader. Um, it truly, 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 we are entering a world in sales right now that is going to be unlike anything we've ever entered in. And you know, my, my goal here is to help you all with that. Another thing here, I think y'all should check out, we developed, um, the team was at the Sales Loft Conference last week. And here is, um, they did an outbound cadence best practice and guidelines. So go check that out too. So I'll drop this for all of you on YouTube, everyone on uh, LinkedIn. So we've got that sweet. Um, so just a couple pieces of content there. And like I said, I'll be monitoring the chat. If y'all do have some Q and a, um, if not, I'm going to dive into, um, a couple of these topics. So first one is how is the change in customer experience? And this is like B2B versus B2C. How is this, um, changing B2B sales? So how is the change in customer experience and how we prefer to buy? How is that changing our experience in B2B sales? So for everyone out there, I'm going to give you probably like two key areas that we have to think about that's, that are foundationally different than what we're doing today in terms of the customer experience. Number one is friction. Most B2B sales processes are, are rife with friction. You've got to hop on a phone with someone Usually that first call, there's not a ton of value for the buyer. It's really focused on like qualification. You usually can't even get a demo till like, you know, five days, six days later. And then they've got to bring in an engineer to talk about it. So in B2C, 
if I see a product, maybe it's a two hundred pair, of, you know, two hundred dollar pair of Jordans. Maybe it's something. Maybe it's something that's four or five thousand dollars that I've done my research on. I just want to be able to buy it. And so I'm telling you right now, in B two B, we have to tear down these walls um, around gates that people have to go to to be worthy to talk to us. It is one of the most egotistical like strategies I've heard in sales over the last probably five to six years. It's like they need to be qualified to talk to us. Like I, I get it. And, I, and, I, and I'm not saying you should talk to like, you have to talk to everyone. But I'm also saying like, if the mindset is, hey, this person's here, let's skip them ahead to step five. If this person's here, okay, well, we need to start at step one or step two. We need to have different plays based on where people are at and their level of intent. Marketing already does this. You visit a website based on other cookies, they're going to route you to different landing pages, et cetera. So again, number one is in B2B, like this is one of my biggest issues right now is we have to start to tear down the barriers, tear down the, the walls around um, how people can interact with you and can they fast track if they need to. So that's number one. The other big change and call it like B2B and experience. And again, it, it, it plays to number one, but we have to have more resources and technology that allows people to learn about what we do, our pricing asynchronously. We used to have this world where it's like everyone had to get on a phone. Um, there was no way for me to find out a ton about your product because you know it was all gated behind a web page. Now I can find out about anything at any given time. And if you don't have an ability, I am shocked how many of you, you can raise your hand, how many of you have a demo pre-recorded that someone can listen to? I'm telling you right now, we're going through this process with a company and they're in beta. And so we're like almost at the finish line. And they're like, and then we're like, cool. Like we have like a group of our, our full-time like frontline staff that we want to make sure to take a look at this. You know, what can you send us? And he's like, here's a recording of a video from like an interview that someone did. And I'm like, how do you not have a demo? Like we would have bought probably three weeks ago if you would have just sent us the demo. Like you don't need to get on the call with somebody. Like there's just absolutely no need for it. Um, and so that's it. We've got to have information for people asynchronously and we've got to tear down the dividing walls. That my friends are the trends that are coming from B to C to B to B. So you better get ready. All right, we've got time for a couple more here. Where are we at? There we go. All right. Uh, how far is uh, too far when we say B2B? Oh, this is a good follow-up. How far is too far when we say B2B needs to catch up to B2C experiences? I don't think we should ever use the human element and their expertise in a sale. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That is a good one. So let's talk about how far is too far in terms of the human to human. I hear this all the time, H to H. And it doesn't matter if it's B2C or B2B, it's H to H. Um, most people don't want to talk to people at certain steps of the sales process. I'm sorry, these are facts. And think about yourselves. Do any of you at the very beginning of a process want to talk to another person? Absolutely not. And so what this means for sales people today is you need to know when the H wants to talk to the other H and not assume that everybody wants to talk to a person to get information. It goes back to what I said is step two, asynchronous information. So my thought is this, you don't need to eliminate the traditional sales channel. We just need to have options. If I want to self-serve and buy something for 15 grand or 20 grand, it is shocking. And, I, and if you've listened to my content, you've heard me tell the story about Salesforce 2021, it's December. I'm out on vacation. We're, we're trying to spend money to get the, you know, bring down our uh, uh, costs or, you know, profit for the year. And I said, great. Hey, man, can you just send me the where I enter my credit card? I'll, it's good. He's like, Jake, let's hop on a call. I'm like, dude, I will hop on a call maybe in a few weeks, but I, I just want to get this done. $40,000 sale, right? Not huge. He sent me over a PDF at salesforce.com. I could not buy via credit card. It's insane. This is, this is just crazy. I literally had to fill out a PDF, take a picture of my phone, fill that out, picture, and scan, scan it back. I'm like, what year is this? 2021 going into 2022? Feels like it's like 1998. We're using like fax machines and shit. So I'm just telling you right now, 
you need to have different paths for different types of buyers. And B2B leaders, this is for you, it's coming now. Your team does not know how to, how to understand intent because they're too focused on qualification. We have to train sales organizations how to understand intent. How much knowledge does this person really have? How much education do they really have on like this feature set versus this? Do they know, are they already using a competitor? So they already know pricing. So it's okay for me to talk about pricing. So those are some of the big ones that again, the things that I think will continue to be B2B is yes, we will still need salespeople for a certain buyer type. But I'm also telling you this, that you need to make sure that you also have other paths for people to buy who don't want to talk to a person until much later in the process, or they want to skip ahead because they've already done their research, or they just want to buy on their own. So that, my friends, is, again, I don't think we're going to lose all the human-to-human -human elements, but I promise you, I promise, if you do not have multiple buying paths in the next year or two, you are going to lose consistently to companies that are easier to buy from. So that is just straight facts, y'all. Okay, I have time for one more here. Let me take a look, see if anyone has dropped any new questions in. I don't see any, but y'all should feel free to drop them in when you do have them. And I'm going to take one more here. Um, as usual, if you DM me on uh, or ask a question on YouTube comments or you DM me on LinkedIn, um, you will get that as well too. So this one's interesting. It's a little bit left of a detour here. Um, it says, which job or role in your overall career contributed the most to building my expertise? What role contributed the most to building my expertise? I actually, this one I've got, you know, I've got this one actually all day um, because I have done, uh, I've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, I worked in professional sports coming out of college. I worked in Major League Baseball. Then I worked uh, in uh, National Hockey League uh, with a team in Phoenix. And I was, I was good. I mean, I, I studied sales. I read a ton of books on sales, a lot of techniques. I knew a lot of sales techniques. I was very good at the technique side of sales. And naturally, I could get uncomfortable. And I had some other skills that I think, you know, set me apart. At 26, left sports and um, started with a company called Career Builder. This is the late 2000s. At the time, they were the number one job site in the world. LinkedIn hadn't really matured yet. Monster was kind of in its, you know, downfall. Um, and I was hired. I was the second, the last person. I hadn't sold anything. I was, you know, a month into the job. I'm like, what is going on? Like, I'm so good at sales. How have I not sold anything? And my director, my boss's boss listened to a call and he said, Jake, why aren't you executing our process? I said, scripting process. He's yeah, I get it. It's there. It's a framework. He's like, no, because we train thousands of salespeople on this because it works. He goes, do you think we're stupid? And we train people on a process that doesn't work. And I was like, well, no, I don't think you guys are stupid. He said, then just drink the Kool-Aid and do it. And sure enough, the next month, I closed $60,000 in new business. And again, if you follow my content, you've heard me tell the story before. But that transformed my what I thought was possible. I, had, I never had realized just how much of a formula and, you know, oh, this person, oh, this, oh, this scenario, this is a J24. Oh, this one is a J34. Like there's only so many pain points that a company solves for and on, only so many challenges that buyers have. And, and once I started to realize the steps mattered, how I set the agenda, the questions that I asked, how I positioned what we do, how I ran a demo, how I put together the proposal, all of that mattered. So for me, it was my first sales role. And then I got promoted to leadership in literally like three and a half, four months. So I went from being the second to last person to sell someone uh, sell anything to running the number one team for two years in a row at a 25 in hybrid inside outside teams uh, for two years in a row. And it was because I learned the process. So if you wonder why you're struggling in sales, if you wonder why you're not getting to your numbers, it could be because you don't have a great sales process. You don't have that documented. And guess what? Then I went and I became a national account executive that allowed me to learn more about enterprise sales. And then when Glassdoor came knocking, I had leadership, I had a repeatable experience, and I had experience selling enterprise. And so I got the first head of sales job because I had a documented sales process. I had a uh, 
process for developing people. I had, you know, again, the techniques and all the other things. So again, without a documented sales process, I think it's really tough to be someone who can really scale a business. So that's my two cents there. So, all right, my friends, we're out of time for this Monday. Like I said before, drop your questions in the comments. I'd love more of the Q&A. Honestly, I, I might be able to start to just do a complete show that's just nothing but Q&A as well too, um, AMA style. But seriously, I've you know been doing this for a long time. Sales is evolving so quickly. I'm going to be doing a ton of content around chat GPT and, and how I think that that's going to impact everything. So feel free, DM me, drop your questions uh, in the comments and we'll come scrape them later. And if I don't talk to you the rest of this week, have a great rest of your week. Start the month strong and I'll see you on the next one.